Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers. Today, my guest is Jeff Bednar, the innovative force behind Profound Foods in North Texas. Since 2014, Jeff has been revolutionizing local food systems and specializing in hydroponic produce. Jeff connects consumers directly to local grown food through his online marketplace, all while fostering community education and supporting future food entrepreneurs. Jeff, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah. So give us a little bit of, you know, what started in 2014 that caused you to decide you wanted to be a farmer or to dive further into farming? Man, you know, we in 2014, I started to get really interested in food and where it was coming from. And it was like three different factors that kind of hit all at once. You know, one thing is, is we started watching documentaries on Netflix and, you know, saw Super Size Me and King Corn and, you know, just really started opening our eyes to our modern system of agriculture and how detrimental that is for the environment and for the health and wellness of our, you know, our bodies and the people, right? So there was, you know, that part, there was another part where I was diagnosed with Marfan syndrome, which is a connective tissue disorder. And I was told I was going to have to be on blood thinners the rest of my life. And I decided that, you know, maybe I could solve some of these problems through the food that makes the body, you know, and food, what we're Mm -hmm. eating nutritional wise. So that's what got us interested in that. And, you know, I've always been an entrepreneur and, you know, had businesses. So it's kind of like was, how do we create a business around uh, something that would be good for the environment, good for the community and good for our family and our own health. And that's kind of where agriculture was the thing that sparked that interest. Mm. So what was, what did the farm look like those first couple of years? So when we bought our farm, uh, you know, before we bought our farm, I had literally never had a house plant. I didn't have any kind of agricultural history. I did not grow up on a farm. Uh, and we, my, my dad was actually bicycling from his house to our house and saw a property for sale. That was a former orchid nursery. Mm. So it was 2.68 acres. It had um, about 14,000 square feet of greenhouses already built on the property um, and then there was a, a barn dominium. And so there wasn't a whole lot on the property. It's a really long and narrow piece of property. And it actually had been up for sale for 10 years. And so all of the greenhouses, the plastic was flapping in the wind and parts were missing and the evaporative cooling wall was kind of falling apart. So it was a, a kind of a, um, uh, I knew it was going to be a project, but I, and I thought I understood how big of a project it was going to be. I had a background in residential real estate doing uh, buying and selling fix and flips. And, you know, we did a lot of construction. So I thought, you know, houses aren't that hard. Why greenhouses shouldn't be that hard. Turns out it's a little bit, a little bit harder than I thought it was going to be, but it, that's kind of how it started was just this, you know, little flat piece of land in suburban um, just North of Dallas in a suburban, almost neighborhood. Yeah. Interesting. You started with basically almost a bit of a blank slate in that you had, do you have any idea of what you wanted to grow at that point? Uh, So I knew how we wanted to grow. And I was at that Mm -hmm. time, I was super interested in aquaponics. And so for the first three years, it was pretty much just experimenting with aquaponic systems and getting, you know, doing research as to what we could grow in them. Um, During that first three years, we didn't really try and sell anything. It was just the learning how to grow phase. So we had aquaponic systems in about a 2000 square foot greenhouse is the first one we got up and going. And then um, we built some raised bed gardens and I became a permaculture uh, design certified. So I started getting into, you know, planting some trees. And so we ended up putting in like 56 fruit trees on our little two acre spot. And Mm -hmm. we got chickens and meat rabbits and bees and, you know, a little bit of homesteading stuff and the same time kind of learning how to grow consistently. So pretty much started with leafy greens. Um, And then we, you know, we've experimented with, you know, at this, at this point, you know, thousands of varieties of stuff, but um, you know, we got, we got a lot of leafy greens, tomatoes, and did some fruiting crops inside in the soil or outside in the soil and inside in the hydroponic systems. Okay. So then you said though, you did the aquaponics for only a couple of years. What was the big change there? So when we decided to go into like full commercial production and we had restaurant customers with orders, we had to build out our larger greenhouse, which is about 8,000 square feet. So we, you know, created the, you know, redid the evaporative cooling wall, recovered it, put in all new fans and plumbing and systems. And we were actually going to have that one be aquaponics as well until, um, you know, there's a cycling up period. And we knew it was going to take, you know, three to six months to get it actually functioning and growing good produce. So 
we decided to do a little shortcut and just start hydroponically and, you know, adding nutrients to the water instead of waiting for the fish to do it. And 28 days later, I had the most beautiful head of lettuce I'd ever grown in, in the three years that I've been doing it. And it was just kind of coming to the realization that managing one ecosystem was a lot easier than managing two. And mm, in aquaponics, okay. you kind of compromise a little bit for the fish and you compromise a little bit for the plants. And the result yeah. is it grows a little bit slower and it's harder to handle pest control. And so we were able to, you know, with hydroponics, we were able to much easier handle pest control, grow faster crops, which means there was less risk of, you know, funguses and, you know, all of the all of the bad parts of, uh, about growing in a controlled environment. And we pretty much since then just stuck with that and kept a little kind of experimental systems going with aquaponics. But for the most part, all of our production is coming out of our uh, hydroponic systems now. Gotcha. Okay. So let's talk about like how your business has grown because you can do a lot now. Um, did you first start selling to, where did the chefs come in? Cause I know chefs was a big first part of your business. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, 2017 in June, um, I had a, I got a call from a chef that I just knew and we, you know, by that time we'd been kind of growing for three years, but not really selling anything, just kind of giving it away to community, uh, you know, uh, uh, food banks and things like that. And I had, I happened to know a few chefs and one of them called me and said, Hey, can I come do a farm tour? We're, we're bringing our whole kitchen staff around and doing farm tours. And I hadn't actually worked with them yet. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And so it ended up being two separate uh, restaurants from two separate chefs that came out and they brought their whole kitchen staff. So it was about 20 people. And when they came out, they started walking around and man, that first chef started looking at all of, you know, before he even got to the greenhouses, he was looking at my fig trees, talking about buying fig leaves. And I was like, what do you do with the fig leaf? I thought, don't you want the figs? And yeah, now we dehydrate them. We wrap meats and cheeses in them and they do all kinds of cool stuff and they couldn't get fig leaves from a big distributor. So he's, he's wanting to buy my fig leaves. And then he looks over and sees our juniper trees. And he said, I want to buy your juniper berries. And then we're <laughs> walking to the greenhouse. We're still not even in there yet. And he's looking at the weeds on the ground and said, you know, do you know that that's henbet? And I was like, yeah, it's a weed. And he goes, yeah, it's edible and we want to buy it. And so he's like okay. wanting to buy stuff I didn't even know was products. And at that yeah. point, I realized like these chefs know way more about the product than I do. I can figure out how to grow it. But if they can tell me what they want, the specific size of the leaves that they want, the type of flowers they want, all of the little details, that that was a lot of fun. And it turned out, I didn't even know this at the time, but the second chef that tagged along was actually one of the best chefs in the Dallas area. And so he mm. was worldwide renowned, James Beard nominated, you know, lots of awards, had a really cool restaurant that sourced 100% of their food locally. Mm -hmm. And so when that guy started posting on Instagram about us, all of a sudden, a lot of the other chefs were following us and making requests saying, hey, if the best chef in town is buying your products, we should be buying them too. And then it just kind of uh, cascaded from there from, you know, starting with two restaurants. A few months later, we had seven or eight. And then, uh, you know, ended up right before COVID, we got up to supplying 130 restaurants. Wow. Okay. So what does that logistics look like? I mean, how many square feet were you managing? What was your range of crops? So um, depending on the season, we're usually growing 150 to 200 different varieties of crops at any given time. And some of those are things that, um, you know, are slower. Like we sell a lot of peach blossoms. Uh, off of our peach trees. And so that's one crop that's only available for a few weeks a year. Yeah. Uh, and then down to like microgreens where we probably have 30 different varieties of microgreens that we grow. So there's quite a few things going and we have a lot of systems. Uh, currently we've got about 10,000 square feet of greenhouses in production and another 50,000 square feet that we're building out and re reconstructing. And I'll get to that a little bit later, but um, so there's a lot of different things growing um, and we're growing in the soil uh, you know, obviously all around the whole two acre property, basically there's, there's different things going, um, you know, as soon as we started delivering to seven or eight restaurants, that was when I started realizing that there was a logistics problem of like, how, how do we actually get there? You know, how am I mm -hmm. going to be the farmer, the marketer, the accounts receivable, the posting stuff, you know, availability list, and then also going and driving 40 minutes down into downtown Dallas to bring the, the products to these restaurants, you know, two, three times a week. And so, you know, the the short version of how we handled that logistics problem is in 2018, we started a food hub. And I just saw that there was an opportunity where if I have all these problems as a small farmer, that all the other small farmers and ranchers do as well. And that kind of gave us the spur to, you know, figure out how do we all as farmers work together to help each other do deliveries, to help each other do marketing and, 
you know, make it easy for the chefs instead of buying from five or six farmers, they can buy from one entity, write one check or have one invoice and be able to get multiple things delivered multiple times per week. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then for other farmers that are part of your food hub, how does that um, pricing model work? Obviously you have to charge them to, you know, offer the product, deliver the product, deal with customer service for the product. Yeah. So when we created the food hub 2018, uh, it was, you know, a lot of thought was put into that. It was actually a couple of farmer buddies and I that were all, you know, kind of thinking this whole thing out. How do we actually mm -hmm. run this as a business? And our first thought was to set up a co-op. And once we figured out how the legal structure of a co-op works and that, you know, there's equal voting rights and you have to become a member, it was just, it seemed really complicated. So we said, yeah, let's create an entity that's an LLC, but essentially we're going to run it like a co-op or a nonprofit in that yeah. our whole goal is helping farmers. Like at the end of the day, Everybody else is cool. Customers are great. But our goal is to help and make a difference for farmers and food entrepreneurs. And so what we said is let's come up with a couple of fixed rules that just make sense that everyone can understand. And the pricing model was the first thing that we had to figure out. And, the, and that was what is the lowest margin that we can make and have a viable business? Uh, and that will give the farmer to be able to, to get as much money to the farm as possible and not have things be overpriced for the restaurants. So we said, we're just going to do fixed margins across the board. It doesn't matter if it's a ribeye steak from our Wagyu farmer, uh, okra from down the street, or our greens from our farm. Let's just have fixed margins across the board. And my farm will pay the same margins as every other farm will. And that, that'll, you know, kind of prove that it's viable. Yeah. And in the beginning, and um, kind of, we have two different segments of customers now, but for restaurants and wholesale, we have a 25% margin. Okay. So the farmer tells us, hey, this is you know what I need for a dozen eggs, and it automatically our system applies a 25% margin, and that's what our customer sees. And that way we never have to go to a, an egg farmer or a you know okra farmer or whatever and beat them up on their price like a distributor mm -hmm. would. You know, distributors are all about how big of a margin can they make. And we said, let's solve that problem by having fixed margins. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Okay. And so then you obviously have the retail side of that too, or the uh, the consumer side. Yeah, so on the consumer side, which we didn't launch until after COVID happened, and, and that uh, you know the whole, chef side disappeared. Yeah, it disappeared over. You know, we went from 130 restaurants to four restaurants overnight. So wow. the following week, we launched retail home deliveries, and on that, what that looks like is essentially um, we already had an ordering system online where all of our customers ordered online, and so all we had to do is create a new customer segment, which we call retail home deliveries. So that customer orders online. They leave a cooler on their porch. We deliver to their homes once a week, right to their cooler. They get text message notifications and all of that. Um, once we got that started, we figured out very quickly that it's a lot more expensive to manage retail deliveries. There's yeah. more of them. They're more complicated. There's a lot more customer service that's involved with it. Um, and the so and there's a lot more packing. So instead of a case of lettuce, we're putting a head of lettuce in a bag, right? Yes. So we yeah. have a 40% margin for our retail customers. Gotcha. Okay. And then obviously I'm assuming you have like a pick pack where they get a list of what they need to deliver. They need to deliver at a certain date. You in check it in, you go to the bags and then it goes out in trucks. Exactly. Yeah. So um, it's all just in time. So we're not buying like a distributor. We're not buying pallets of things yeah. and pulling off of that. Uh, when the customer places an order, the vendor gets a pick ticket. They bring us exactly what's ordered. We check it in, just like you said, and then uh, usually same day, if not next day, is when that product is going to go to our customers. Okay. Um, is has Market Wagon made a a move on the Metroplex there? I don't believe they're in Dallas yet. I have I have heard of them in other markets, but uh, I haven't heard anything about Dallas. They're probably like, well, you're already established. Why try to fight it? Because they're everywhere else, and it's really oh, wow. interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, they're in Columbus, they're in Cincinnati, they were over in Indiana. I think they stopped some of the Indiana places, but um, interesting. Yeah, it's interesting that they realized that they could not make it work with you guys there. Um, so then, all right, so you've got that side of things and talk a little bit about um, your marketing for that. What does that look like? Well, we do a lot of things. Um, interestingly, one of the things that's got us the, the kind of the biggest subsection of customers is going out and doing community related events. So mm -hmm. we go to as many events as we can. We've got a, a, you know, just a killer team that works for us. And, you know, we take public speaking engagements and, you know, try and get in, in front of as many people as we possibly can. And that building relationships has been pretty successful. 
Um, okay. You know, obviously we try to do a lot of posts on social media and, you know, find people through that as well. Um, we really don't, you know, to date, you know, we've been around for nine years now and I think my total marketing budget is under $2,000. So okay. we really don't do a lot of paid marketing. Um, I really want to. I want to do things where I can see that this amount of time and effort returned this amount of money. And a lot of times, with you know, putting up a, I got asked to do like put my banner inside of another business the other day, and they wanted sixty five hundred dollars to put our banner on the wall. And I'm like, that's not gonna, <laughs> you know, like how would I track that banner working? You know, we're gonna come up with a code. <laughs> you know, it just didn't make yeah. any sense. The ROI and that seemed like it would be zero. So, you know, really looking at things that uh, make a big difference. And then we've done a lot of community partnerships with different organizations and nonprofits. Um, so that's that's been pretty good for us. Um, and, you know, just kind of a lot of little things. It, it's something that seems like it adds up a lot, you know, showing mm -hmm. up for everything we can. And, you know, at, at one point early on, we kind of figured out how to, um, you know, hack the media a little bit you know, becoming friends with the people that write stories, whether it's Dallas Morning News, D Magazine, news stations, finding out who's actually producing the content and starting yes. to feed them like a public relations would. We essentially handle that ourselves. So we, we're, we're shooting them uh, anytime we get something new or exciting, we're sending yeah. that out. And so we get a lot of publications uh, or a lot of, we get publicized a lot and that's all free. It just takes our effort to be able to get into these newspapers and get on TV and that kind of thing. Yeah, all right. I'm going to write that down because- we have a marketing guy now. Well, we have a marketing team and that's something that we need to start doing. We've, we've had this year, we've had three different TV segments, yeah. um, but I know that's just the beginning. Literally one person came out because it was raining too much and they needed a farm that they could literally stand and talk about how the rain was horribly affecting us. Now it really wasn't because we're in tunnels and we just, you know, roll with it, but they wanted a segment. We gave them their 90 minute seconds. Yeah, I got Sorry. I got on one recently this year that was when the you know remember when egg prices were going through yeah. the roof. So I sent something back and we sell a lot of eggs. I don't grow it. You know, we have a few yeah. chickens, but we're not selling our eggs from our farm with 50 chickens. But I got to make a little comment on there about how, you know, we're keeping our prices the same because our feed prices didn't go up with all of with the farmers that we work with. And yeah. so we got a pretty good little uh, you know, media bump from that one. And that was just kind of just something random is we're listening to the news and seeing what stories do they want to be fed, you know, and kind of telling them, Hey, this is, you know, yeah. I basically reached out and said, our prices are staying the same. And that was newsworthy, you know? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. It is actually really interesting about what this, and it also is interesting that they, a lot of times go into this with a story in mind, and they're going to make the actual people that they visit on the ground fit that narrative that they want to show. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right. So you've got these going on. Let's talk a little bit about your team here. Cause you got a lot going on. So how do you, <laughs> how, how have you built this uh, core team, which, you know, makes everything tick? You know, we, a few things. So one of the things that I found uh, really interesting, this didn't actually happen until after COVID is we, when COVID hit and when our business was kind of just blowing up because we had this, re we were doing home deliveries when no one wanted to go to grocery stores. Uh -huh. We started hiring all of our friends from the service industry. And, you know, having been in a few other industries in the past, I've never met harder workers, including farmers, than service industry people, people mm. that work in the kitchens. They, they, are, they work as hard, if not harder, than a lot of the farmers I know. And they're in there for long hours in the heat. And, uh, you know, I think we got a pretty work, nice work environment. We get to be outside or in the greenhouse. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're in a stuffy kitchen with crazy smells and heat and all of that kind of thing. And uh, so hiring people with a really good work ethic has made a big difference for us. Um, and then at some point, you know, I became, I'm on the board of advisors for a, a few local colleges, Dallas College and Collin College in the county that we're in here. And um, we volunteer and, and uh, partner with Texas A&M, UNT, and a lot of the different colleges around. And so the cool thing is, is I get to speak in front of a lot of uh, young people trying to figure out what their career looks like. Uh -huh. And, you know, whereas they say the next generation of farmers isn't there and we need to work on it, like they're there. They just don't know that there's a possibility to do mm -hmm. farm. All they think about is kind of like what they saw on TV or, you know, they don't know that there's new ways of doing farmer uh, farming that's kind of engaging and fun. And, you know, mm -hmm. in our specific thing with hydroponics and greenhouses, it's not like it's a bad work environment. Um, and, uh, you know, we pay living wages. 
So I think, you know, we're also really close to town. So there's, this is the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. Correct. I think it's the fourth largest Metroplex in the country. So there's a lot of people here. So, you know, the combination of people that are super passionate about food and agriculture, um, that they want to learn and they're willing to learn uh, and they're hardworking. You know, it's kind of like, that's where I think we've got this like pinpoint of being in a really good spot for labor. Yeah. So you've got the collect the connection right there. Uh, obviously, you've got a big story, which people love and seem to be buying into that they get this, you get this big thing of your mission of changing the food system there. You've got those connections with the colleges. How did you build those connections where you became on the like advisory aspect? That's really interesting. Um, just, you know, I just, I just show up for everything, man. And this is one of my, probably my single biggest weakness is I have a hard time saying no. Okay. So I get I get asked to do stuff all the time and I say yes and I basically kind of put it on my team to pick up the slack when I'm not here because I'm out, you know, down at the college speaking on something or going to one of the advisory meetings. Uh -huh. uh, and then, you know, I also became a member of the Farmers and Ranchers Freedom Alliance. I'm on the board of directors for that and the Texas Restaurant Association. And uh -huh. so if you think about being a community based business, which is what we're really trying to be. It's yeah. constantly being in the community and, and pulling people out when you go and meet these kind of rock stars, you know, bringing them in and saying, man, it'd be great to work with you, you, you know, come up to the farm sometime and, you know, whether they volunteer for a day or end up getting hired by us has, has worked out pretty good. Um, yeah. At some point, I reached out to the college and uh, one of the colleges and said, hey, you know, we've got these greenhouses. Here's what we're doing. I know that you have an agriculture program and you haven't built your own greenhouse yet. If you guys wanted to have all of the students come out here for their lab days or internships, we'd be open to that. And, you know, they just about fell apart when they heard that, you know, they were super excited. And so I think the last three people we hired was started off as uh, unpaid interns from the college. They're required to do 20 hours a week for so many months. So we brought them in and, you know, we picked out the best ones and brought them on the team when the internship was over. Very cool. Um, do you have a, very, a specific training program that you put them through, like um, a whole process, or is it more just on the job training? Right now, it's pretty much on the job training. It's kind of been on my, you know, on my never ending to do list to come up with a more formal process. You know, we, we definitely get a lot of people in and I think schools are really good at teaching people kind of that academic knowledge. And then you actually need to get your hands in the dirt or your hands in the water, the hydroponics, or, you know, like you need to actually do the thing. And you need to do it for money. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of community gardens that are doing some really great work out there. But when you're giving it all away, there's not the same um, like consequences. Like there's like the yeah. delivery van has to leave at 11 o'clock or restaurant mm -hmm. chefs get pissed off. You know, so like there's a yeah. little bit of pressure on that where there's not as much pressure if you're just driving it all to the food bank. And so I think that we're in kind of a unique situation where we're um, we can give people some really good experience. Mm, absolutely. Um so let's talk a little bit about some of the other things you do. You do a bunch of dinners too. Talk to us about kind of like how the dinners work. Yeah, man, the dinners got started about four years ago. And it was, you know, I was actually just had one of my chef buddies over to the farm on a tour. And I was kind of showing him one of my big empty greenhouses. It was just a 3000 square foot high tunnel that was 20 mm -hmm. years old and not used. And I was saying how much I wanted to create that, you know, turn it into a full greenhouse and add the heaters and evaporative cooling and, you know, just make it work year round, fill it up with hydroponics. And that I thought it was going to cost my, my estimate at that time was like 40 or $50,000. And he said, well, man, we should just like throw a dinner out here and I'll volunteer my time and we'll sell tickets. And then you can use the money from the tickets to put into this project. And I was like, man, that'd be awesome. So I did a, a video post on Facebook saying exactly what we wanted to do. And at the time we said, let's do two dinners. We'll do mm -hmm. one in the fall and one in the spring. And then you buy one ticket, you come to both dinners and you can see the before and after. So come oh, look at this big empty pile of crap cool. and then yeah. come back and see when the greenhouse is finished. And, um, you know, I, th I think we, I don't even know what we charged 200 bucks or something like that. And, um, man, it was one of the most fun things we've ever done. Everyone who showed up was passionate. They wanted to help us. They love local food. The chefs had a great time. We ended up with five executive chefs and then each dinner. So it was 10 total chefs. So, you know, wearing my marketing hat, these chefs walked out to the farm They came out and they ended up buying more from us and being better customers because they could see everything that we had. They loved giving back. And mm -hmm. so we got better customers out of it. And then everyone who showed up was interested in being a customer as well. As well. At that time, we only sold to restaurants. So we basically said, hey, if you want to try all this beautiful food, you got to go eat at restaurants. 
Now when we do the dinners, we can get them as weekly grocery customers. So it's yeah. really, really good marketing. And um, that was four years ago. We stopped for a while during COVID. And now we do, uh, we call it by a season. And a season starts from fall to spring when it's not too hot out. You know, we're in North Texas, so it's miserable in the summer times to try and do that. But uh, yeah. we do one per month. This year, we're doing seven of them. And each one, we bring five chefs, five courses. Uh, we went around and partnered with spirit companies. So whether it's, you know, booze or wine or beer, all of that gets donated. So they bring in those for free and provide them for our guests. And at this point now, we're kind of a little bit more established and figured things out. So we actually pay the chefs for their time. We cover okay. 100% of the food cost. And we also give them a little bit of guidance saying like, hey, the pork farmer's got a bunch of extra jowl. Can you maybe do a course with jowl? Because that's what we need to move out of the freezer. And mm -hmm. so we kind of guide them a little bit for the menu, but otherwise we just let them play and do whatever they want to do. So it's really a good time had by everybody. Um, we typically host 60 to 90 people and the tickets are about 200 bucks a person. Wow. 60 to 90 people. And you typically stick with that. I think you mentioned like still do five chefs at a time. Yeah, we'll do one dinner a year. That's um, we used to call it the legends dinner where we bring in, um, you know, like famous chefs. We've had, you know, a few like Curtis Stone has been out to the farm and cooked on here and Dean oh, wow. Faring and Robert Del Grande, Stephen Piles are a bunch of kind of like just you know, they're really well known in the South. Um, so we brought some of those chefs out. So this year we're doing one next month in December 17th, and it's going to be a seven course dinner. So we've got seven uh, chefs and these are mostly like country club chefs. Very cool. OK. All right. So you've got the, the food hub. How many different uh, vendors do you have in there? About 65 right now. 65 vendors. Okay. So, wow, you must have really good, um, really good breadth then on your products. Yeah, we have quite a few things. I mean, every protein that can be done locally, you know, beef, chicken, pork, quail, lamb, goat. Um, and then we've got chicken eggs, duck eggs, quail eggs. We've got low temp pasteurized dairy, artisan breads from multiple vendors. And then we do like meal kits, chocolates, candies, jams, jellies, pickles, um, just We've got some things that are like locally made supplements, um, mm -hmm. you know, really just kind of anything that would make sense to sell along with it. We've tried yeah. doing some skincare products and things in the past and didn't, didn't do very well with that. So we really just kind of stick with food. Yeah. Um, so talk to me then about how many staff are on that side of the business. So total uh, staff for all three of the businesses between the farm, the foods uh, and events is 14 people. Okay. And so the interesting thing is, and this is where it gets harder to track my labor and I could do better at, uh, is that some of our guys will get here in the morning and they're doing harvesting. And then as soon as harvest is done, they load them into the refrigerated vans, drive over to our food hub, which is about three miles away. And then they do the picking and packing. And then they go on the restaurant deliveries or the home deliveries, come back and then get into seating if they get back early enough. You know, so that's kind of yeah a little bit of every, we all do a little bit of everything. And yeah. uh, there's a couple of people that exclusively work on the farm, but pretty much on the food hub side, we're just pulling farm staff off to help fill in that. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, so you guys are hopping then. You stay hopping. Yeah, we stay pretty busy. And this, you know, especially this season is kind of our busy season. Everything's growing really well because it's a little cooler yeah. about event season, you know, between we do, we do one dinner a month on our farm. Uh, that's a public one, but then we also host like corporate parties and uh, yeah. We, we, in addition to that, I haven't even mentioned yet that we have an, a, our food hub is actually at an event space. So we took I've over seen pictures, the, yeah. yeah, gigantic commercial kitchen. So we have, it's 13,000 square feet, three miles from the farm. It's a Eesh. commercial kitchen, food hub and event center. So um, right now that's where we do all of our distribution from. And then we host events over there. Like this is the season when we're doing breakfast with Santa cookies with Santa and each one of yeah. those will bring out. The goal is to sell 120 tickets to each one of those. We can seat 350 people in the event center. Um, and then we also have about 15 companies uh, in our kitchen that we use as a, a startup incubator. So we look for small brands that are just in our community. If we find them at the farmer's market, they're doing cottage law products. They're yeah. baking out of their home oven and they want to get to the next level or they want to start selling to restaurants or, or grocery stores. And so we'll actually bring them into our kitchen space, give them a dramatically reduced rent rate, like a third the price of any other commercial kitchen. And then we help them get their manufacturing license, insurance, and introduce them to our contacts at grocery stores and restaurants and see if we can help them move their products and build a business. 
Very cool. Very cool. Um, what kind of, what size of coolers do you have at that space? Cause I'm just thinking with all the different products plus all these kitchen people. Yes. So they're in the kitchen space. There's three walk-in coolers. The one that we primarily use for distribution is 12 by 14. Okay. Which sounds very, very small. But if you consider that most of the products are going in there and coming right back out an hour later or at most the next night or the next afternoon, uh, yeah. we're able to pack a lot in there and it's too small. So we're actually under construction right now as we speak. I've got two guys in the barn working. We're actually building a 600 square foot walk in cooler uh, here at the farm. And wow. so we're going to move okay. our distribution from the location down the street back to the farm because we can build a much larger walk in cooler. And we can't really do construction in the commercial location that we're at over there. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Corinna, what is our marketing tip of the week? This week's marketing tip is yes, lives in the land of no. When it comes to marketing your products, you have to be comfortable with getting the no. There will always be people who will say no to your offer. When you go out and try to pitch a particular product, whether it's in person or through an email or through social, some people will be a natural fit for it and they'll say yes. And there will be uh, other people who will not like it no matter what you do. So every product has a, what I call a unique conversion rate. And once you find out what that conversion rate is for a particular product, you know, it just kind of is what it is. So for example, if I have to ask 15 people to get one CSA sale, that's 14 no's for every one yes. And if that's just the way the numbers land, well, then I just have to move through 15 people to find my one yes, right? So we have to be comfortable with going into the land of no and asking a bunch of people, getting the no's and not making it mean anything. Yeah. And I think that's where like direct sales jobs can burn you out really fast and can be really challenging. But if you can stand the no, you get so many yeses. And that's what makes a really good salesman. I know many of us farmers did not get into this business to be doing this, but if we want to do what we want to do, which is farm, then we have to get the yeses. So we have to be able to take those no's. Yeah, but I think it also just takes the emotion out of it when you realize mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. oh, I that product only has a 10% conversion rate. But then you realize it's just because that's what the numbers say. It, it Suddenly it doesn't feel like, oh, I'm a failure as a salesperson. It's just like, no, that's just what the conversion is. And I'm not going to take that personally. So I think that's really a really powerful concept to understand that you're going to have to face some no's. Don't be afraid to go into the land of no. It's part of the process. Absolutely. If you want more farm marketing tips like this, check out my top rated weekly show, the My Digital Farmer podcast. I teach marketing concepts and interview lots of farmers to find out what's working and not working in farm marketing to help you find more customers, increase your sales, and build a strong brand for your farm. Look for the My Digital Farmer podcast on your favorite podcast app. What would you go back and do differently if you started the whole business over again? Oh man, the, I think that the biggest thing that I would do differently is the first several years, I was not worried about making any money. Mm. I was more worried about learning how to do what we did and starting to build a brand and kind of become known. And so I respent all of the money that we made on just, you know, building the farm and, you know, getting equipment and making things kind of pretty around the farm mm -hmm. so we could host these events and that kind of thing. And I wasn't concerned about profitability. Uh, and I really needed to have been a lot earlier than now. So now we're in a little bit of a crunch of, you know, seven months ago, we bought our neighbor's farm and we went from 2.68 acres to 10 acres. We bought an additional 50,000 square feet of greenhouses. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, it's got, we're, you know, we, I was just telling you before we got on the call, we bought a tractor. And so now I've got all these additional expenses and a huge new mortgage payment. Yep. And had I, you know, thought a little bit and planned a little bit for the last five years, it, we wouldn't be, in, you know, kind of a, a little bit of a cash crunch. Yeah. There's a lot of projects I want to get done right now, but it's kind of like, let's focus and get this one done and then this one done mm -hmm. uh, and then make some money and then we can work on the next thing, if that makes sense. Yeah, we're actually in the same boat. We're in the midst of a big expansion and it would really make sense to build a 24 by 20 foot walk-in cooler. But by the time we pour the floor for that and then build all the walls and put the refrigeration in, it's a bit of money. And so we're yeah. like, oh, we just kind of got a hold. We can't can't quite do it quite yet. 
So, so I was quoted yeah. about $80,000 for that same walk-in cooler. And we ended up just finding one a few weeks ago from a restaurant that went out of business that was 600 square feet. And we got it for a trade deal. So the whole walk-in cooler and everything, the only thing I had to do was raise the roof of my barn three feet yeah. because it was the part of the barn slope was too low. Yeah. Yeah. So we didn't need to pour the slab. And, you know, that's, it's just one thing after another, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, I already have the panels for this. I have six inch freezer panels oh, yeah. already. So all I need is literally to pour the floor and then really to get started, I probably could go ahead and just put in three, um, put in three, uh, just cool bots. Cool bot. yeah, yeah. And it'd be all set to go. So, um, I, I just, I probably need to just go out and get that quote because it's going to make it really hard to close that whole, we have a whole new pack and wash and it's going to make it really hard to insulate that if that cooler's not there. So yep. we just might go ahead and just pull the, pull the trigger and do it. So, yep, absolutely. Um, so with all of this, do you like, um, do any like 80, 20, um, like analysis and say like, where is like your actual, where is actually like the, the best part of the business for you guys? Yeah. So we, we, we look at that definitely on a pretty regular basis. Um, and it's kind of, you know, I use the same thing with what is the emergency that we need to put out now? Yeah, or what's, yeah. What, what fire is burning the hottest or, you know, it's going to get out of control the quickest. Um, and you know, right now the kitchen incubator side has actually been really good because mm -hmm. it's collecting rent. So it doesn't yeah. take as much, um, labor and effort as the actual farming part does. So part of the reason we want to move the distribution from that kitchen space here is it actually makes more room over there to bring more people into the incubator. Gotcha. So, um, you know, that's one thing that we've been thinking about a lot lately. And right now we're actually going back through, you know, with growing hundreds of varieties of products, it actually is pretty difficult to figure out what our cost per unit is. Uh -huh. And so we've been spending some time kind of making that per category, because as we are about to turn on 50,000 more square feet of greenhouses, we really need to know what's going in there in what selection and what crop mix. And so that's something that we're, you know, actively, it's probably the most important thing I need to finish before they finish building the greenhouse, you know, recovering the greenhouses. Yeah. Yeah, that's adding over an acre of covered space, which is yeah. uh, a lot of space. I'm assuming it's all concrete floors. Uh, there's concrete strips in it. So oh, we're okay. Gonna, yeah. yeah. And then gravel. Walkways. Yeah. And yeah. it will do mostly hydroponics. So it's all going to be raised off the ground. Yeah. Very nice. That makes it super easy. Um, talk a little bit about like... Um, doing this with your family? Because I know originally you said you wanted to start and kind of do that. Have your kids stayed involved or? You know, my, uh, it's funny. So I've got two daughters mm -hmm. and they're uh, 13 and 15 years old. And so when we first bought the farm, I think they were four and six years old or some, somewhere in there. And they love being on the farm. They love being out and helping me with absolutely anything that, um, that they could help with. And that growing up and showing them the life cycle of animals and plants was was really special. At this point, it's a little bit like pulling teeth. So one thing I've kind of the hack that I figured out is my kids do not like to work for me, but they love working with 26 year old Maisie and yeah. 20 year old Cheyenne. So like <laughs> they'll, it's it's kind of like, hey, if you guys want to get some hours and they're on they're on our payroll, they're on ADP. So they're getting yeah. they're getting paid. And so when they when they have time in between school or on breaks, they'll I'll send them out and I'll pair them up with one of the staff, and they'll actually do really well. Um, yeah, they they have both decided that they are not interested whatsoever in getting into farming. My older daughter wants to be an attorney, and so she said, "Well, maybe I can become an attorney that would do something to help food uh, help farmers." Yeah, it's pretty cool, and um, I'm all all for that. And um, you know, my dad worked for the farm for the last seven years. And then about a year and a half ago, he decided he wanted to go down to one day a week and it would be a volunteer day. So he's in the grow room right now, fixing some of our flood and drain tables. Um, and he drives in once a week. So that's, you know, really fortunate to get to work with my dad and, you mm -hmm. know, special projects. We'll call my brother or my brother-in-law and they'll come help recover greenhouses. And it's, uh, it's definitely special to me that I can have so much of our family around and, um, yeah. you know, kind of be here in this, I think is a pretty healthy environment. Yeah. Yeah. With restaurants, what are the trends looking for right now? You know, it's interesting that I'm noticing that people are starting to get a little bit tighter on their spends. So, um, you know, with the economy, the way that it is, there's been some of the garnishes that we've been growing in the past. Seems like those orders are starting to drop down a little bit. And I'm starting to get a little bit of uh, people asking about price of things. Whereas the past, you know, six years of working with restaurants, they never really 
they didn't ever qual you know say anything about the prices very rarely anybody would and yeah. now they're starting to give us a little price pressure so you know that's something that we're definitely looking at moving forward especially with the new greenhouse coming online is you know what are the things that are they're not as price sensitive on um i also you know know that restaurant labor has gone through the roof uh -huh. you know whereas they used to have people for 10 or 12 dollars an hour now they're 20 dollars an hour and so they're cutting back on some food costs because their labor cost is higher and they're also cutting back on some of the components on a dish you know, if you're going to a white table restaurant they might have 15 different steps on there well now they're seeing about how do you get that down to six steps for uh -huh. you know or six components on a dish and so that's uh definitely something we're watching yeah and their protein is probably something that they're not going to change so they're going to look at something else yeah, we're, um, you know, we sell some protein, but mostly what we're selling is, you know, larger cuts and ground meat. You know, we don't sell a whole lot of steaks to restaurants. The, yeah. you know, local farmers, the price of, you know, my cost on one of those ribeyes is probably 40 or $50. And by the time we put a margin on it, and then the restaurant does, it, it would be a $200 steak. It's just, it doesn't work. Perfect. So that's where, you know, a lot of the, off, the offal cuts, we sell a ton of that and chicken bones and feet. Um, and so there hasn't really been much of a change on proteins for us. Yeah. What would you say your favorite product in your food hub is? You know, I'm partial to the Wagyu. I probably talk about yeah. it a lot. I mean, uh, you know, we, we, they've got some really cool stuff. Um, and you know, we have a chef that works for us and, uh, up and up until recently, we kind of paused it for a little while, but we did family meal every day. Oh, cool. So the chef is cooking, uh, for the staff. He makes an awesome lunch using all local food. And was cooking for everybody every day up until a month or two ago when we just kind of got busy and decided to pause that. But um, a lot of times he would cook leftovers. So, you know, for my family, my wife would get home and dinner was already cooked. Mm. And so I'm I'm pretty open. Um, peach season is probably my favorite season of the year when Nona Orchards is down by about an hour and a half away from us. And there's nothing better than fresh peaches. Mm -hmm. So we'll bring in, you know, pallets of peaches. They're, they're yeah. so good. Yeah, we bring in from, I think the best peaches we've had have been from Pennsylvania. We we bring some in from, from um, Georgia as well, but the quality, I don't know. I don't know if they just, they're not picked ripe. They're always picked green because it's right. just hard to ship, you know, and that's why local peaches are always so much better. Um, yep. But yeah, this was peaches that we were over in Pennsylvania. We picked up and brought home a pallet with us. And That's uh, awesome. Yeah, made it work. But uh, yeah, I think that fruit is something that, um, I mean, strawberries are our number one seller here. We just added blackberries. We're adding raspberries and blueberries. So hopefully that will help too. Yep. But peaches is kind of hard to do here in Ohio organically. Right. So absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you say, what's the future hold? I mean, obviously you've got the 50,000 square foot greenhouse coming online, but what's your thoughts beyond that? Oh man. So we we've, we've been toying around with a lot of different things. You know, one of the things that we're we're really most interested in is this uh, kind of idea of fostering and creating new food businesses. Mm -hmm. And uh, having the incubator kitchen has really opened my eyes to what a difference that we have the ability of making of getting people that think that they just have a cool hobby going to the farmers market making 300 bucks. You know, we we just got one of our brands. We've been working with her for a while that's in our kitchen called the Jelly Queen. And mm. she had her first order for Whole Foods, which is like 1,400 jars of jam. And her price on those to Whole Foods is $9 a jar. So it's an amazing product. And she's starting, that's with 10 stores. And they're talking now to her about going into 38 stores. Wow. You know, it's a pretty cool step yeah. to see, get to watch that. So we're really kind of toying with this idea, especially with all of this greenhouse space that we're, you know, it's honestly, when, if we filled it all up tomorrow, it would be more than our market could sell. Yeah. So- that's where we're thinking, man, if we could continue to bring in maybe some, you know, younger people that want to get into farming, but don't have access to land, don't have access to resources, and we've got this space here. What if we were to bring them in and do a similar farming incubator program where we could, you know, help teach mm -hmm. them to farm, mentor them, give them some space. And then when they outgrow the space that they have here, help them get, you know, get a little land access and get into their own farm. All the while, our food hub can still sell all of that stuff for them, handling all their accounts receivable and marketing and you yeah. know, all of that. So kind of create more of those farmers all over the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. Correct. Yeah. Now that's they a lot of people don't realize just how much time and effort that overhead eats up. So if they can literally just sell it to you and you deal with all that for a startup business, that's huge. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. 
Yeah, very cool. Well, Jeff, I uh, appreciate so much your time coming on today and uh, talking through kind of what's going on in your world. Um, you got a lot going on. And um, I've, I, I watch you from afar. I know we've met a few times here and there online, uh, but always interested in seeing what you guys are doing. Keep up the good work. Thanks a lot, man. I really appreciate uh, let me let us share a story on the on your show. Absolutely. So there you have it. Another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.